today designing modern board games based on George Philly's forthcoming book, A Class in Board Game Design. Lecture 2, Carcassonne, Representations. So today what we're going to do is to discuss the game Carcassonne. Carcassonne is the game you will be playing in laboratory tomorrow. And then I will advance to discuss the various aspects of games and game design. And so we could reasonably say, first of all, that if we have a game, in some sense it satisfies the various elements. So there's a representation There is a theme. There is perhaps content. There are mechanisms <coughs> and styles. Those two are actually kind of the same list. That is, if I give you a list of mechanics and a list of styles, in some sense, they're pretty much the same thing. Then there is shape. We haven't really discussed that one yet. And there is voice. And those two are topics that are sort of specific to my discussion. And there are components. If we discuss Carcassonne as an example of this, well, there's a representation that is, if, I, if we take someone who knows very little about gaming and looks at it, they'll say, oh, it's a board game. And if we ask the theme, the theme very loosely is medieval. Now, that's very loosely because, yeah, there's city walls, and there are the sorts of people you might expect who are wandering around medieval Europe, but there's very little medievalism in it. Content. Content is the historical research you do to um, generate the game. And the historical research may be a wall full of books on history of World War II, many in for obscure foreign languages, or it may be it's a pirate movie. We rented Pirates of the Caribbean to learn what pirates are like. Um, but if we talk about the content, there's some pretty pictures of walls. Uh, if you look at the innards of those medieval cities, though, really, real medieval cities were crowded shoulder to jowl with buildings because walls were expensive. Components. Components is what falls out of the box. And there are tiles, and there are counters. The meeple. There are rules. There is a scoreboard. And there are some parts that don't really do anything in terms of the play of the game, but keep the part, everything else in place so it doesn't rattle and damage itself when you carry. Okay, what are the mechanisms and styles? Well, we could say that Carcassonne is a tile-laying game. That is, in order to play the game, what you're doing is putting down square objects. You could also say it's an area control game. We'll be coming back to what these mechanics and styles are, but those are the main mechanics in the game. Uh, someone who was mm, somewhat precise on these things, <coughs> Mickey, could also say that it's a racing game in the sense, you are pushing your counter across the scoreboard, and whoever gets the furthest distance by the end of the game wins. But it's not really a race that much. <coughs> oh, yes. Shape. It's a Euro game. We'll say more about that in the future, too. Voice. Well, if you ask, what is the player's position in this? Are you playing a person? Are you playing a couple of people like a D&D &D game where there are four of you pushing 12 characters into the death trap? 
Um, the voice, I would say, is abstract. That is, if you ask, well, what are the players doing, it's kind of hard to be precise. All right. So having said this, what are the more detailed rules? Let us then take this down. And ask what the de detailed rules are. Well, first of all, there are tiles. And the tiles are square and have various features on them. Roads, things that are supposed to resemble city walls, loosely speaking, nice pretty green areas. If you look, there is occasionally a road that runs out of steam in a building. This is a cloister. And so you start out, you have a tile. You put the tile down, and you draw another tile. Or you draw a tile, and you put it down. And when you put the tile down, you're required to make the edges map. The roads don't mysteriously come to a stop when they hit the edge of the board. Instead, if we have a cloister here, when I play the next tile here, it must have a matching road on it. Now, if you think about this, I've just told you that there are a whole bunch of different varieties of tile, and you might legitimately ask how many different types of tile there are and how many matches there are. Well, there is a match where there is a road coming out of the end. There is a match where, and where there is an edge here covered with city. There is a match where there is an edge covered with green. And if you think about this, if you wanted one tile with each type of edge on each side, how many different tiles are there? Um, this is sort of a quantitative analysis problem, but it's a sort of thing you want to think about a bit in game design. If I told you there were 12 different edges and you had to find a tile that matches this nice square with sides A, B, and Q on it, um, you'd need an awful lot of different types of tiles in order to have a hope of finding a tile that would fit in. If you say there are only three types of edges, that's still a lot of different types of tiles you might have. And for example, you could have A, B, Q, or A, B, Q the other way. And you notice that tile is chiral. It has handedness. There are actually two tiles that do A, B, Q, whatever. And they're different because they're left and right handed. If you're going to do a tile laying game, as soon as you start having more types of edges, it gets harder to match them. Now, there are ways of beating this. One way to beat this, which you do not say in Carcassonne, is say, well, here's a tile. And this is a tile. We're doing a space exploration game. And yes, there's a star in the middle, or a black hole, or whatever. But all of the information is inside a single tile. Well, that's fine if you don't want terrain features of any size. If you're trying to do a large island, if you're trying to do a game like Sunda, that's in the book. You can read about it. If you're trying to do a game on building islands, you have to think about how you construct the tiles so, A, they will fit together, and, B, you aren't permanently stuck in the position where there is no way to fill in a hole because there's no tile that looks like that. So you see the issues on tile laying. It looks very innocent, but it's not. The second piece of the rule game, if you put a tile down, you have these little pawns, followers. And you are allowed to put the followers down to take control of an area. And on one hand, this is area control. I put a follower on the cloister, and I now control it. However, while I have now controlled the cloister, the 
I have this little issue that I have to keep in mind, and the little issue that I must keep in mind is I keep putting different followers down. I don't have an infinite supply of them. I am subject to a mechanic known as limited resources. To be precise, I have a grand total of seven to, uh, followers, and once I've put them all down, I don't have any more followers to put down. Under some conditions, I can recover them. I can recycle the followers. If I put down a follower here on the road, I have taken control of the road section, and if someone is so kind as to play here, that's at road intersection, I now control the whole road and I get points for the whole road because I've controlled it. To be precise, it's one point per road, so I get three points and I get my follower back. Ditto, if I have a city section here and I put a follower on it and someone is kind enough to play another city section here, you see this is a, a rather funny shaped city, it's shaped like this cross section of clam. However, this clam city, uh, I have, it's now a complete city. I am the person with the follower in it. I get the control of the city and I get points. Um, if you are doing a rules design though, and you say, well, you get points for taking roads and you get points for taking cities, you have to realize that there's no particular rule guaranteeing that things will be put down in a nice, clear order. In particular, I put down this tile adjacent to a tile here, and I have a follower on the road. And someone else put down a tile here, and they have a follower on the road. And now, third person puts down a road section there. Gee, we now have one road with two followers of two different colors. And therefore, you need a rule on how you handle the matter. If you think about things a bit, you realize that there are several obvious rules you could do, all of which work. As Kipling said, there are six and ninety ways to construct tribal lays, and every single one of them is right. So you could say, you each get all the points for the road, or you could say, you split the points for the road. Or you could say, it's a tie, no one controls the road, no points. Those are all good rules. It's just, you have to say what the rule is. One of the points of playtesting, if you have competent playtesters, is to catch the serious places where you have forgotten little details that people would have liked to notice. And you fix things. Now, in order, I'm now going to take a slight detour on playtesting, since I brought it up. And I have pointed out there are several different rules, and there are several different quote-unquote obvious rules. And the question is, which do you use, and what do the playtesters do? And the important issue on that is as follows. We have groups of, mostly groups of four people. I don't know the class will split evenly into groups of four if we stay at 30 people, there are going to have to be some groups of three or something. But having said that, what you are supposed to do as a play tester, you will get the rules, you will get at least an image of the components, and each person in the play test group has to study the rules and figure out how to play the game. And then when you show up for the play test session, the first thing you do after you learn the rules, there are several different ways to learn rules, is that you do a talk session in which you play each of the phases, each of the things you're going to be doing in the game, and as you make a move or take an action, you say what rule you're using and what you think the rule means. And everyone else listens to you, and they this is where you notice that different people are playing different games because they have different interpretations of what was supposed to be the same rule. 
where someone failed to notice that there's this rule over here which is very important in affecting what is happening over here and the implication wasn't noticed and there are collisions. Now the way this breaks down which I have seen happen, is that someone says, oh no, we don't all have to learn the rules. I'll learn the rules and then I'll just sit here and talk at you and teach you what the rules are. This does not work for two reasons. The first reason, which is why you are sitting here taking notes, some of you, and why, you're, and why you have the video, but more important, why you should be taking notes, is that if I just sit here and talk at you, some of you will remember what I said. Some of you will forget what I said. Some of you will have been distracted by something I said earlier and will completely miss what I was saying. And verbal communication is not a very effective way of transmitting high precision data. It really isn't. The second issue is that if I have one person teaching the whole game as opposed to everyone learning how to play the game. Well, if that person is an idiot or has some unique ideas of English grammar or simply didn't take the job that seriously, you will learn how to play some game that will bear only marginal semblance to the game that you actually had in front of you. And so having people teach you how to play the game as opposed to reading the rules, does not work for playtesting purposes. Um, it also does not work too well for general gameplay purposes. Uh, how many of you have ever heard of Monopoly? Good. Um, it turns out there is a standard Monopoly rule, I don't play the game myself, which is almost universally misquoted in common play with the result that most people Whoever play it has to do with when you're allowed to buy things. There, I've given you a clue. And most people who are taught how to play Monopoly are taught the rule incorrectly, and therefore Monopoly play in common use and Monopoly play, and God help us, there's competitive Monopoly. There are even people who play Monopoly with real money. Um, in any event, um, the real rule as it was intended by the designer, and the rule that you see, because I was taught this by someone, are not the same. So I have now given you the warnings on teaching people how to play. Well, having said that, I will briefly note that there are three sorts of areas that can be controlled sort of the same way. There are roads, there is cloister, there is the city, and all of these three features all have the property that at some point you have built the whole city, you have built the whole road, you have completed the cloister, which means it's completely surrounded by territory. And at this point, points appear. The points are, are recorded on the scoring track. You get your meeple back. You get your followers back. And so there is one scoring mechanism that looks like this. However, if you read through the rest of the rules, you discover there's another scoring mechanism. And in the other scoring mechanism, what you do is you put a follower down on a green area. The follower who's dropped on a green area is a farmer. The farmer gets points for each city he's next to. How many points? Well, I am advised it depends on which edition of the game you have. And there are the original rules, and there are the new rules, and there are the newer rules, and therefore I'm not going to answer the question because two-thirds of the time my answer would be wrong. You might hope you will all get the new edition. The one I showed up with yesterday was a first edition. It is marginally possible to tell the, two, the editions apart by looking at the box cover. Because on the cover of the box, there is the fellow on horseback in armor, and there is the young lady um, carrying a bowl of something or other, fruit it appears to be. And in some editions, they are looking at each other. And in some editions, they are ignoring each other. But you have to look fairly carefully at the cover to tell them apart. I actually cannot unless I have both of them in front of me. Um, okay, so having said this, 
you put farmers down, and the farmers are permanent. The farmer stays on the game, on the ground, until you run out of tiles. When you run out of tiles, oh, there's an important rule. Game N. How do you know the game is over? And the answer is you're playing tiles, and at some point you run out of them. And when you have run out of them, the game has ended. And you then score the farmers. And the farmers get points, namely, a farmer gets <coughs> generates points for each completed city he's near. There is a detailed rule on what the word near means. Halfway across the board can be near. Here to here might not be near. But there's a rule. So I, we have discussed sort of how Carcassonne works. And the notion is you're going to play the game twice. Well, actually, you're going to play it two and a half times. First, you're going to play 10 or sort of 10 or 50, 20 tiles down and use that as game end and do the scoring so you're sure you're all in agreement on how all of the scoring mechanisms work. And that's the general statement in playtesting. You might play a shortened game, but you have to be sure that you use all of the mechanics. And then you'll play the real game. And then you'll play a variant game. And in the real game, you draw a tile and place it. In the variant game, you have a hand. And the hand has several tiles in it, because you drew them in advance. And you draw a tile, and you now have a choice of which tile you place. And maybe your opponents can see which two or three tiles you have. And maybe your hand is hidden, and they only get to see the tile you're choosing to play. You notice there are a bunch of choices here. The hand could be one tile or two tiles. I wouldn't get bigger than that. The hand can be visible or hidden. And the question, the lab report, is to analyze which gave a more interesting game and why. Why is important. Um, it is just as I will take an exchange I had on one of my novels, and I, the comment I got back from someone, well, this was something you should drop in your trunk and forget. And I did the important thing. I asked, well, why, is it, why did you not like it? And the answer I got is that Minute Girls, that's the novel, uh, is too dense. There's too much material in it. It's like a C.J. Cherry novel like Citine, where there's a lot going on, and you have to pay detailed attention to the whole thing to understand what's going on. So, for example, there is the final scene where the young lady, who's actually the heroine, and the um, fellow, she has... They've sort of been pursuing each other at long distance. And the last thing she does is to ask him if he would please readjust the position of her combat knife, which was in one of her pockets. And if you have not been paying attention and say, well, they're standing up necking, there's something in the way. And if you were paying attention, you realize that she just asked him to marry her, and he just agreed. That's what density does. Well, in any event, I have talked about Carcassonne, and I have made a fairly explicit point of not teaching you how to play it, because if I teach you how to play it, you won't study the game carefully yourself. Are we good to go? And I've told you what the lab will be. And now we are going to proceed. Spaced in between all of these lectures... Oh, wait a moment. Spaced in between all of these lectures, there are, there's homework. Do we remember homework? At the end of class, since I didn't tell you to do it, bump the homework in a pile there. Those of you who didn't catch there was homework due today, turn it in tomorrow. It's in the handout. Okay? Okay, so what we are now going to do is an extended series of lectures where we look at each of the aspects of what makes a game. And there are a considerable number of aspects, the elements. And we will be working through for, oh, the first three or four weeks of the class, anyhow. And the first element is the representation.
And if we go very far back in time, there are what might be described as classical games like Go, Moncala, or Owari, Chess. If you go very far back, there is a game whose name we know. It was Senate. We have no idea what the rules were 5,000 years ago. And some of these are basically you scoop holes in the ground and have stacks of beans. You sketch lines and have different tokens. You have pieces. And these are things that go very far back in time. They're classical folk games that people have been playing for a very long time. <coughs> However, if we move forward from that, games that appear out of antiquity that were not, have not changed very much since then, uh, we find other things. Now, I say not very much. The rules of chess have actually changed a great deal with time. Once upon a time, the queen only moved one or two squares. And thus the king was a much more powerful piece because it was quite much more difficult to checkmate. It is the situation that happens now if you've lost queens and rooks. Now the king is one of the more powerful major pieces. Uh, the other change in chess was the introduction of pawns may skip two spaces on the opening move rather than one, and the response to that is called en passant capture. En passant capture is sufficiently historical that it was not until oh, the time of the American Civil War that the last National Chess Federation accepted that en passant capture should be a legal move rather than an illegal move. So they're classical games. And now we are going to advance to something resembling modern strategy games. And I'm going to do these in approximate historical order. Um, I have to say approximate because they're complications. And so in some sense, the first thing we have are miniatures, games with toy soldiers. And there are antecedents. But if you ask, when did we see things that are games, people, things that people play for entertainment that use toy soldiers, we actually go back to H.G. Wells, socialist, libertine, science fiction author. If you read War of the Worlds, you can hear the rattle of the dice in some of the encounters. And Wells wrote a little book, Little Wars, about fighting wars with toy soldiers. It came out just before World War I. We advance one interwar period, and you hit Fletcher Pratt. And Fletcher Pratt had a fairly quantitative, not necessarily accurate, but quantitative game of naval period naval warfare. Period naval warfare did not use aircraft, which in the late 20s were close to ineffective under serious conditions. Uh, it was battleships and cruisers shooting at each other. The miniatures have gone on a fair time since then, but there are games with toy soldiers. There is a type of tactical game. Now we advance to the late 1950s, and there are several places where we can start. But one are, is assuredly board war games. And board war games, modern board war games, you can find antecedents, but modern war, board war games are due to the game Tactics 2, which was the invention of Charles Roberts, who just died a couple of years ago. Uh, Roberts um, was a military officer, and he conceived of his game as a training game, but that's not the direction it went. And Tactics, 1953, and Tactics 2, 1958, gave us board war games. The rules I handed out are, it's not a modern game, but it's a game with relatively short rules that you can imagine learning during this course. So they're board war games. What else happens in the late 1950s? Well, if we go to the late 1950s, there are several branches here. But there was a device known as the Brainiac. The Brainiac was a hard-wired 
computer. It didn't have logic, it didn't have electronic switches. It had mechanical wheels that you had to rotate by hand. But it was a computer and it had a game with it. You also hit the very first electronic <laughs> toys. There was a Disney spaceship control board. And the spaceship control board, among other things, had things that lit up and it had a remote communicator, namely a buzzer that you could use to send Morse. If you were so lucky as to go to uh, the Pittsburgh Museum of Natural History, there was a computer. It was a hardwired computer. It used relays. They were big relays. They may have been purpose made because they were really big. And you could watch it play tic-tac-toe against you. That is, you made a move and you indicated what you did, and, the comp and you could watch the relays go click, 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 or actually thong, thong, thong. They were big relays, and it would deck it. Played a perfect game of tic-tac-toe. And very slightly forward from that, 1962, at MIT there was a PDP-1 computer, 16K of core memory, can't beat that. It cost several million in current currency, but it was the one computer at MIT at which an undergrad could do a hardware thesis. And someone built, I got to use it, the first joystick, and having invented this, they built Space War, the first computer, real computer war game. So there is Space War, and we are now up to Oh, 1962. Of course, 1962 was a long time ago. It wasn't much of a game. It's what can you do in 16K? Um, so that was a lot. So I guess we've said there are computer games, loosely speaking. In 1960, Alan Callhammer. created diplomacy. And diplomacy had the feature, yes, it was sort of a war game. You were refighting World War I, but the combat was fundamentally inconclusive. <coughs> the core of the game was negotiation. Also, it was a large multiplayer game. It was a seven player plus referee preferably game. <coughs> it was something that you actually needed a healthy group of people to be able to play. And it was sort of, yeah, you could say, was it a war game? And this was disputatious. But you could say, well, it's sort of a war game and not. But I'm going to group it as separately. Because I'm going to move ahead. I've got several other types of games to go. We will now advance to 1970. And the company is called Flying Buffalo Incorporated. And Flying Buffalo <clears throat> had a play-by-mail game. Now, under modern conditions, this would be play-by-internet, but it's 1970. There is no civilian internet. Instead, the moves were generated on paper, mailed to you via the post office. If you wanted to negotiate with other people, you telephoned them or sent letters. But you had games with 7 or 15 people. And come 1971, the founder of the company, Rick Loomis, who is still around, had a friend point out to him that if we program this on a computer, you could play the game because you'll have some staff member, he was up to a couple of employees this time, type all the moves into the computer. And the computer will do everything, and now you're on the same basis as everyone else, and there's no question of how things are proceeding. And so, in 1970, 1972, they bought a Raytheon 703, a machine which most of you will never hear of again, except this is believed to be the first computer ever purchased specifically for home entertainment purposes. 
and it is, gave us the first computer game. Now, the communication was by paper mail, and you got teletype output, because that's how printers worked back then. They were teletypes. <clears throat> you got printed output. The number of players was large. Well, the memory of the machine isn't that big. The number of players was not that big, but it could be 10 or 15. It was a massive, roughly speaking, parallel game and it was the very first of these. And it was played on a computer. And so if you are interested in massive, I'm using the word massive somewhat enthusiastically, massive multiplayer games, the game is Battle Plan. Oh, by the way, Flying Buffalo Incorporated is still in business. Not only are they the first computer game company, they're the oldest. They're still around. We now come, we need a little more space here. I'm sort of doing history of representations and different types of games. And we advanced to the early 1970s, and there were two friends of mine who were very fond of medieval warfare. And they decided to do a campaign based on Tolkien games. There are several different versions of this story. If you want to read a sort of modern one, what you should do is pick up John Peterson's book, Playing at the World. And they had a set of miniatures rules, chain mail, and they added to the ch chain mail <laughs> rules a bunch of rules a lot inserting magic and individual characters. Now, individual Miniatures gaming, skirmish gaming, had been around for a long time. But this was actually, each player controlled one, one figure on the board, and you had interesting events involving small numbers of figures. The two friends of mine were Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson. And the rules they invented, a variant on chain mail, were known as Dungeons and Dragons, which some of you have heard of, I suspect. Yes? How many of you have heard of it? Oh, good. OK, it's everyone. <clears throat> now, there's one peculiarity in this. They really started out creating a set of miniatures rules. And the creative act was a set of miniatures rules like this. It was not planned we are going to be doing role gaming. In fact, it wasn't realized that these are role gaming rules when it was produced. The explanation, this is not a set of miniatures rules. This is a new branch of the hobby, was published as a review in American Wargamer by me. So in a certain sense, they invented, created the device, and I will make some claim having figured out that there is such a thing as role-playing games, and gee, they invented it. Um, there have been some other creations since then. Um, and on this one, I will do the antecedents after I've talked about the original. Once upon a time, there was a very clever fellow who's still around who had this very nice board game, which has since been produced. And he went to one of the local board game companies and said, I have this neat game. Isn't it good? And they looked at it. Yes, it's really great. There's one problem. It will cost a mint to print. We can't afford to take the risk. And so Eugene Garfield said, well, that's fine. But I have this other game. And it's probably not going to be as good a seller. However, you play it with cards. It's very cheap to have printed. And therefore, we'll produce this, and we'll probably make enough money so we can print Robo Rally, which was the expensive game. And so <clears throat> after some humming and hawing, they produced Magic, the Addiction, excuse me, Money, the Gathering. You know the game I mean and made more money than you can imagine, and incidentally did print Robo Rally. And we have here collectible games. That is, games with collectible parts. 
as opposed to games which are rare or unusual and therefore worth tons of cash. Um, that was the successful end, and there have been plenty of imitators since. The first collectible card games, though, are much earlier than that. If you go back to the 1950s, roughly, um, there are what are known as collectible baseball cards. That is, you bought bubble gum, and there were cards inside that represented different players, and you tried to complete, accumulate a complete set. However, though I don't remember anyone mentioning this at the time, I saw the cards, after all, I am that fossilized. Um, there was attached to the cards a game, and you could play something that in some vague sense resembled baseball using the collectible playing cards. Uh, there are several other variations of collectibles other than baseball cards. There are games played on a board with plastic figures, which you are obliged to paint carefully. And the companies producing them go to um, official rules, official figures, and planned obsolescence. So you have to keep mailing them large amounts of money to keep playing. And so you can have collectible games with solid parts that are collectible. A modest variation on this, um, which is somewhat more straightforward. There are a series, the company that always comes to my mind is Stratomatic. I think they're still around. And Stratomatic had a baseball game. And it had a set of cards for each of the teams in the, each, um, in the baseball leagues. And each of the players was assessed statistically as to how good they were. And when you had the set of rules and data and all of this other stuff, you could play out a season, all of the teams playing each other, using the real player's characteristics. This is sort of an early version of fantasy football. But it was collectible in the sense that every year you had new players come in, you had old players retire, you had different statistics, and you therefore had a new set of cards going out. So those are collectible games. OK, are there any other types? These are all representations. I mean, if you see a bunch of people with funny-shaped dice and little toy <coughs> figures talking at each other, it's probably some role-playing game. <clears throat> if you see people with playing cards doing strange things and they're funny-looking cards, it's a collectible card game. There are several other games. There is what is called live action role-playing or LARP. Now, there are several pieces of this that are quite independent from each other. If we go back to before most of your grandparents were born, like the 1920s, there were parlor games that were detective games. And so we have a group of people who've come together for the evening. Television hasn't been invented yet, so what do you do? You play games. And someone has placed clues around the house, and each person gets a role, and they're all, you're all playing detectives, except one of them is the fake detective, because he's the murderer. And so you are trying to figure out who the real murderer is by trading information and clues. 1920s parlor game was live action role playing. We can also, very old idea, if you are in drama theater, there is something called improv. Now improv is basically only a game for the people on the stage. The audience is just sitting there. But improv is sort of like live action role playing. If we march forward towards the present, uh, we pick up several other pieces. There are bunches of people, the Society for Creative Anachronism, for example, and various Civil War groups that do reenactments. Now, the reenactments can include battles. And so the SCA has an event called Penzik which includes 
folks dressed up in real sort of armor and dulled weapons and other neat things, re and they fight out what are sort of medieval battles. Uh, the Pemsic battles will have more people in them than most historic medieval battles, which were much smaller. After all, we've got a lot of people in the United States. And so we have reenactment. However, the reenactment spreads out way beyond fighting battles to reenact all of the aspects of medieval life you can imagine. <coughs> For some reason, my suggestion that modern biotech will eventually produce diseases, diseases that do not kill you but give you all of the amusing symptoms of black death, typhus, cholera, so you can experience a real medieval life and then it stops. For some reason, my suggestion that they should look into this didn't go over too well. Yeah, some people just are, don't get into things. Okay, I have two more, and I am almost out of time. And one more representation, and one more thing that is not a game. And the representation I would call text-like. Now, the first text-like game would probably be choose your own adventure books. So you have a book, and you come along, and it says, if you choose to kill the demon, go to page 37. If you choose to flee from the demon, go to page 88. If you choose to offer the demon a jelly bean, go to page 196, text-like adventure. But those are really solo games. However, there is Tales of the Arabian Nights. And Tales of the Arabian Nights has a board, but a large piece of it is a text-like adventure. You look in the book and you see what is going on and various outcomes happen and there's a fairly thick book of events. And so it is a text-like multiplayer game. Okay, we are done with games and I shall briefly mention simulations. And these are mostly historical simulations So sometimes we attempt to do simulations to predict or understand the future or understand alternatives if we do certain things. And the notion of historical simulations is that you have an object that looks like usually a board game, but maybe not. Maybe it looks like a role game. And we are using this as a research tool to understand what is going on. And so we have a game on the Battle of Gettysburg, and I will play this basically solo because I'm just trying to understand the history as opposed to having a few sketch maps and text of who attacked who. And these are also used for practical military purposes, for example, testing new doctrine, testing new equipment, testing new weapon systems, historical simulations. So we have chugged ahead, and I have discussed now a whole bunch of different representations, that is, things that look very different from each other, but that are all tactical games of some sort. Um, you are welcome, as an extra homework problem, to point out things I have forgotten. I did forget to mention one. LARP that has been completely abstracted. Team sports. It's a military, something like women's lacrosse or marine football, 50 men on a team, three footballs, three quarterbacks. It's military, but all of the military aspects like guns and knives have been abstracted out. I have run us out of time. Class is dismissed. Please do turn in your homework.